God does not stand behind you with a club, but in front of you with a glass of Malvasia, a sweet, white, possibly sparkling wine. That's the quotation I got from Martin Luther. It's been contextually translated into the English with the thought that it could have been sparkling wine that Martin Luther talked about. You might be asking, wasn't that invented by the French? Wasn't that Dom Perignon who came out of a cellar one day, all excited, saying, brothers, brothers, come quickly, I'm tasting stars? Well, it's actually fascinating because I've done some research on the history of sparkling wines, and I came across an Italian scholar, Professor Mario Frigoni. He was professor of wine and viticulture in Italy, and he wrote a paper not too many years ago entitled A, a History of Sparkling Wines. He did a lot of research, and he found out that in classical antiquity, the Romans were the pioneers of making sparkling wine. It was called spumante in Italian a little bit later on. And it was made in a couple of different ways. First of all, they would do a double fermentation. And they've actually found this in Pompeii, where the places have been excavated. And they found out that there, there are pipes in which cold water was uh, carried and processed into the cellars. And there they would put their amphoras, where the recently crushed and fermented wine would be stored. Well, I've done this uh, before on my own accidentally, where I've taken some Viognier that has been partially fermented. I put it in a refrigerator and I brought it out and sure enough, it was sparkling and actually tasted much like champagne. Well, evidently the early Romans used to do that. It was called a, a process of fermentation that was a double fermentation. It was brought out of a cold place and allowed to, well, ferment a little bit more, sparkling right before it was served. Well, another process that was used in the ancient Roman days was a result of back sweetening the wine. Sometimes the harvest would be such that the grapes wouldn't be come in, coming in fully ripe. There is an author that I found out that wrote about Malvasia in the 1600s. He came from Crete and settled in Italy, and he talked about in some years how the Malvasia that was being grown in the southern part of Europe would have been back sweetened with boiled wine from a previous vintage. I thought that was interesting because with back sweetening, you can imagine that there would have been some fermentation going on because the wines would have been made in such a way that a filtration process would have not likely have occurred, nor would there have been a lot of fining agents. So there would have been some residual yeast. If that was the normal way of making Malvasia back in the 1600s, it was likely the same in the time that Martin Luther wrote. He wasn't that far. Uh, back in time. In fact, Leonardo da Vinci that preceded Martin Luther, he had been growing Malvasia in his property. And Leonardo da Vinci was a wine expert. and He probably had sparkling wine as well. God does not stand behind you with a club, but in front of you with a glass of Malvasia, a sweet, white, possibly sparkling wine. The reason I, I brought up that subject was because today I'm talking about the sparkling nature of Christianity. When I was at seminary, I, I had a professor by the name of Kurt Marquardt. He was a bit of a character, a little bit on the ultra-conservative side. He made a distinction in the New Testament between regular spiritual gifts and the spectacular spiritual gifts, like miracles, signs and wonders, and that sort of thing. He called the former the more natural gifts the more simple gifts like teaching and service and so forth, as ordinary gifts like ordinary wine, and the more spectacular gifts like the miracles and that sort of thing as bubbly wine or like sparkling wine or gifts. I was thinking about that a little bit later on because there's been a lot of testimonial evidence of God at work, and not just in Bible times, but in the here and now. A couple of cases that I think about often is how close to where I was growing up in the San Diego area at Mount Soledad uh, Presbyterian Church, Don Williams was the pastor. And in one of the interviews that he has given on the internet, he shares a, a testimony of a physicist who was on the faculty at the University of California in San Diego. And Don Williams points out that the physicist had, was a really uh, intelligent guy. He, had, he was, had been at MIT and had come across from MIT and brought 25 people with him to establish an optics lab 
there at the university. Pastor Williams mentioned that this fellow was converted as he watched a girl arm actually grow as she was prayed for. She had a withered, distorted arm. Don Williams later on became involved in the Christian ministry and the healing emphasis. So yes, those type of miracles still happen today, as well as accelerated natural healing things. That's what usually happens in the prayer ministries. When people get better in a faster, quicker way. And of course, sometimes God doesn't heal. In fact, oftentimes he will not do it in a dramatic way because God prefers oftentimes to hide himself. But every once in a while, we pray for miracles and they happen. There's a Christian apologist, a Christian writer by the name of Clark Pinnock. And one time Clark was going through a very difficult time. He was doubting his Christian faith, even though he had written books on defending the faith. And he was beginning to kind of think, maybe they were really meant to be like parables, fictional stories. And then he got prayed for and a dramatic thing happened. He received healing from a case in which he had a serious macular degeneracy in his only functioning eye. This was back in 1982. And Clark Pinnock had such a miraculous thing that happened that he later on wrote, he said, I know from personal experience that one such incident can be worth a whole bookshelf of academic apologetics for Christianity, including my own books. Which brings me to today's topic, and that is the role of authenticating miracles. There's two two ways of looking at miracles. One is the ontological problem, and the other is the epistemological problem. The ontological problem is more of a theological in-house type of debate, and that's whether it is in the nature of God to have an economic time in which he doesn't do any miracles. I went to a seminary, one of our Lutheran seminaries in Fort Wayne, Indiana, where they took an ontological position that God, in his nature, his economic nature in post-New Testament times, no longer gives spectacular gifts. They took that position more out of a reaction to the hype hysteria hysteria and hucksterism of the charismatic movement, which was really running rampant in those days, and people were splitting up churches. And so the people at the seminary thought, it's just best to think about those type of things as happening out in the mission field or just really restricted to the first century. As time has gone by, we've taken another look at scripture and history, and we've looked at the evidence from the systematicians who are Lutheran and the exegetes and the scholars, and we've decided to come up with a soft continuationist point of view, and that God still does miracles, although one can't look to these signs and wonders as evidence of having a spirit-filled life. If you look at the nature of God in the New Testament, you can see that God did do miracles even apart from the apostles. That's another question entirely to explore. And in the early church, there are abundant references to miracles continuing, which leads me to the epistemological argument that comes from another point of view. The skeptical argument is that philosophically, miracles are improbable. And it's really based upon what David Hume popularized. And that is to say that it's always more likely that any particular claim to a miracle is false than that the miracle actually took place. In other words, the argument goes, it's always easier in light of the firm and unalterable laws of nature to believe that those who testify to a miracle are in fact in error more so than they're telling the truth. Back to John Warwick Montgomery, when I started this series, he was alive and I actually sent him a little note saying that I'm doing this series. And he said, I look forward to watching the rest of the videos. He'd watch the first one for sure. I think he might've seen a couple of others as well. Well, at any rate, he just passed away the other day as I'm doing this video. But back in the earlier days of Montgomery, when he was still on this earth, he wrote a book called Principalities and Powers, a book on the paranormal. He argued, Montgomery argued the case, and keep in mind he, he majored in classics and philosophy at Cornell. Montgomery argued the following. Montgomery argued that the care demanded when we look at paranormal events and authenticating them is no less than, but also no greater than that required for events in general. Montgomery pointed out in his book that to require a greater proof of super, supernatural events is to introduce the fallacy of David Hume under another guise common experience of the non-supernatural is supposed to reduce the probability of the supernatural to such a point that the tremendous or greater, perhaps infinite, evidence would be needed to establish an allegedly supernormal event. Montgomery goes on to state, but this reasoning assumes what is not in evidence, and what cannot be in evidence, actually, 
namely that an already known uniform structure of interlocking experience that allows the sum total of non-supernatural events to reduce the probability of supernatural events. Montgomery says this, quote, This naturalistic bias is exactly what is in question. Not knowing the universe as a whole, we have no way of calculating the probabilities for or against particular events. So each event must be investigated ad hoc without initial prejudice. Unquote. So Simon Greenleaf in the 19th century, he was the guy that I quoted before. He wrote uh, the book on the uh, rules of legal evidence. He was one of the foremost experts of jurisprudence. In fact, his three-volume of work was used for a number of decades. And as a believing Christian, Greenleaf explored the philosophical arguments against miracles. Greenleaf uh, was in that period of time when David Hume's approach was quite popular. And he, that Greenleaf tried to, to look at that argument. Greenleaf said this, he said, quote, the use of Mr. Hume's argument is this, and it is an important and valuable one. It teaches us to sift closely and rigorously the evidences for miraculous events. Unquote. Greenleaf continues, It bids us to remember that the probabilities are always and must always be incomparably greater against than for the truth of these relations, because it's always far more likely that the testimony should be mistaken or false than that the general laws of nature should be suspended. Unquote. But then Greenleaf continues, Further than this, the doctrine cannot in soundness of reason be carried. It does not go the length of proving that those general laws cannot, by the force of human testimony, be shown to have been, in a particular instance, and with a particular purpose, suspended. Unquote. Which brings me back to that initial quote that I started this program, that God stands behind us not with a club, could be translated rod, but with a glass of Malvasia, a sweet white, possibly sparkling wine. God doesn't hit us with the law in such a way that we have to work our way into heaven. God uses the law to gently guide us into an understanding that Jesus died for our sins at the cross. And well, God loves us and there's nothing we can do about it. That's what faith is all about, trusting in Jesus. And miracles that happen today Miracles remove the obstacles. They remove the obstacles for us to believe the testimony of Jesus that the eyewitnesses and close eyewitnesses have put down in the book. And miracles also confirm to us that God is a good God. He shows us all of eternity, but he also even now demonstrates what eternity is all about by giving us a glimpse, a foretaste of the feast to come. God isn't looking to scare you into following him. Rather, he wants to give you his providential care, his goodness in creation. John Mark Montgomery is no longer with us. He's with the Lord. In his younger days, Montgomery would enjoy a glass of champagne, a glass of sparkling wine, and he'd celebrate life. And now he's with the Lord, awaiting the great wedding feast of the Lamb. I wonder if Dr. Montgomery himself was welcomed by the Lord as he left this world welcomed with perhaps a glass of a sparkling white Malvasia. Because after all, that's the Reformation quote from Martin Luther. It's what Martin Luther loved to think about when he thought of God's grace and mercy. God does not stand behind us with a club, but with a glass of Malvasia, a sweet wine, possibly sparkling, to show us that the goodness of God is like an effervescence that bubbles up within us, the joy, the peace of the Lord. That's the default experience that God wants us to have in his kingdom. May God bless you as you continue in the faith, and may you be aware of those signs, wonders, and miracles that God does in perhaps small ways in your life.